now, what has this letter got to do with an interview in 1972 at MGM Studios in Culver City with Harry Harrison, who was the writer of a book called Make Room, Make Room, which came out in 1966. In 1972, I was in Hollywood and I found myself at MGM the week before one of its famous lots of beautiful sets was sold for I don't know, a car park or shopping centre or something like that. And I was on the set of Soylent Green, which was the film version of Make Room, Make Room, written by Harry Harrison. I interviewed Charlton Heston, and you'll find that interview somewhere else on William Broom's YouTube channel. I also interviewed Edward G. Robinson, and you'll have that interview later on. But the one interview that was most unexpected was with Harry Harrison himself, the writer of make room, make room. He wasn't the writer of Soylent Green and he was most upset that the story had been changed quite significantly. However, the core of the story, which was Los Angeles and a time when it was hugely overpopulated and polluted and where a lettuce like this would cost probably a month's wages because it was very difficult to grow vegetables because the soil had become so polluted. And he, very unusually, was allowed on the set of the film. Now, normally, film producers don't want the writers of the original book anywhere near. They are anathema because they're always criticising. But for some reason, Harry and his lovely wife, Joan, were allowed to spend time on the set. And he was, as I said, very critical of the film. He thought that the script was shocking by someone that had no interest in science fiction whatsoever. Of course, the perfect choice to make a film about uh, a polluted Los Angeles of 2022. They were particularly upset that the film was being made on a pretty tight budget. They really felt that it should have had a bigger production. And they wanted Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward to play the leading parts. They ended up with Charlton Heston and Lee Taylor Young. Harry Harrison was a very interesting man. In fact, his daughter has published his autobiography. I recommend uh, anyone that's interested in science fiction read it. He, like so many young people, was influenced by the magazine Astounding Stories in the 1930s and 1940s. And he became one of the 1960s and 1970s top science fiction writers. And Make Room, Make Room is one of his many books. The film Soylent Green was a surprise hit for MGM. In fact, it was their only successful film of 1973, and it remains a cult classic today. The lettuce you'll see in the film is a highly prized, along with the one extant tree in Los Angeles, because the, popu the population has now grown to such a high volume that food can no longer be produced and the fact that the greenhouse effect, which was a big talking point in the early 1970s, has reduced the um, growing power of the soil. So something which we take for granted, a lettuce, was in the Soylent Green era, something which you would kill to possess because, remember, most of the food was soy lent, made of soya and lentils, which ironically, for a film he basically didn't think was very good, is the one work in which his reputation is secure. The interview between Harry and his wife Joan was not recorded on tape. However, the following is a short recorded conversation between Keith Howes and Harry Harrison's wife Joan on the set of Silent Green at MGM Studios in Culver City near Hollywood. In it, she speaks candidly about their thoughts on the book and the film. Joan also talks about her life in England, where she had lived previously. You know, I have to get a new passport. My last passport I got in England in 65. Yes. I have pictures of both their children in this country. <laughs> in their past. Did it... Um... It must have been very depressing for your husband to assemble all these facts you know, at the time to realise, you know, what was what was actually happening it before. It took him six years, you know, and at the time he wrote the book, he thought he was writing it too late. Then when it came out, he thought he'd written it too early. He wasn't a very nice person to live with while he was writing. Sure. Instant manic depression. 
Raj? Well, is he, is he a full-time writer? Oh, he, yes. He is. Oh, yes. He's not a scientist or anything like that? Nope. Full-time writer. We, we did the obligatory bit of 10 years of raggedy underpants, you know. And now things are a lot nicer. Good. I you mean, got a good price for the book? Well, let's not go into that, shall we? I look at it as free money. Yeah. So you can't take off for a year on it. Well, the thing is, since he is a freelance writer and established enough that uh, he gets an idea for a book, he'll call his editor in New York, mention the idea, uh, send him an outline, he gets a contract and half the money straight away. This, we've lived abroad for 16 years. He's only back here five years. So we, you know, it's not a question of taking off because we're always, you know. Yeah. But what is nice is that after he finishes a book, he doesn't have to ask a boss for permission for a holiday or anything. No. We can we pick up and go skiing for three weeks, you know, to get the dust out of the cobwebs out of the brain and use the body sure. or something. So you went to school in England, did you? Mm -hmm. what, what school did you go to? Seaton House. Seaton House. That's very familiar. It's Sutton Surrey. I've heard of it. Yeah. The yeah. right across the street from it. Yeah. He just had to roll out of bed into school after putting on five layers of underwear. It was great. <laughs> well, I mean, in those singers, I feel these extras are far too well dressed considering, you know, their deprivation. Mm -hmm. They, um. That was the American way of giving you a medal or saying, <laughs> right on, mate. Because, uh, for one thing, their hairstyles are far too glamorous. I mean, they've got, you know, they've got dye, they've got bouffant mm -hmm. hairstyles, they've got wigs, the they've got shoes. And the girls are wearing eyelashes, yes. right. Shoes, right. they look too healthy, their skins are too, too good, Actually, you know. Actually, one of the directors wanted to get people, um, really emaciated looking types mm. out of veterans hospitals, yeah. you know. But they weren't permitted to do that. No. Uh, and there was one enormously fat woman. Now, nobody in this crowd should be fat. No, no. Well, look at that bloke yeah. there. Yeah, right, right. Everybody should look, you know, like those horror pictures of Dachau. Mm. It is, I mean, it's very, very difficult to get the most serious of people, but I think they could have made it better by, well, for instance, they're wearing too glamorous gla their, their glasses are, you know, first class and all sort of Well, things. they're not supposed to be wearing uh, eyeglasses while they're being filmed. In oh, fact, I see. Uh, when they start to film, he yells at them. Well, no cigarettes, no eyeglasses, ladies, no handbags. But they're still too well dressed. Mm -hmm. well, a lot of the women are wearing lipsticks, really. That's right. Lipsticks, like the girl right here. Uh, and and the pants, in fact, you know, they, and they, shoes. they wanted to do something special with the makeup, and they weren't permitted the money or the helpers to do it with. No. But visually, all right, they, when you read the book and you see the film, you realize that. Um, Something's been bugging up sometimes, mm. you know. But uh, outside of, I would say visually, it has been pretty successful. Have they shown you the interior sets? Um, I saw some stills, yes. Mm -hmm. I could only judge. They're very tiny, yeah. pictures, I couldn't really judge. Yeah. But this, but I think, is excellent. You know, this is this perfect. Very, this, very this, we hit it lucky. Mm. Tom Heston looks very well fed. Yeah. Well. All right. 